Vyanati Vyanasya Gyanandana Sakya Chakshuna Vyanamena Trasmai Sri Guru Vena Well, um, so we're still staying on the, um, on the point of personal conviction this afternoon. We will not uh, move on because there are a few more sessions and I think that um, this is the basis of everything. And after that we can talk about faith in our community and you know, how we live together and so on. And uh, what is realistic in the world that we live in. Because sometimes you get faced with, well, what I call a cultural transplant. So the Prabhupada, of course, came to the West and he brought uh, Krishna consciousness and brought it into the West. And it was like Tulsi coming to the West for the first time. Uh, Prabhupada's disciple Govinda Dasi gets the credit for growing the first Tulsi in the Western world, which, you know, was, is certainly um, something extraordinary and Prabhupada recognized it. Um, but just as Tulsi was transplanted into the West, into a new environment, um, Krishna consciousness also was transplanted into the West. And um, how to practice Krishna consciousness in the West? Meanwhile, in India, people didn't stay behind at all. Oh no, uh, although they stayed in India, they went to the West right there and then. <laughs> I mean, people more and more rapidly became Westernized. I was in India in 1975 when Indira Gandhi uh, banned Coca-Cola from India. I was also in India in the 90s when Pepsi-Cola returned. And I remember what a celebration it was. I mean, there was no more water in the Bhagavatam class. There was Pepsi in my cup. People were brushing their teeth with Pepsi. It was just anywhere. It was just Pepsi, Pepsi all over India. Boy, I mean, in Vrindavan, they even named a building after Pepsi. We still have it, the Pepsi building. And that's how important Pepsi was. And when Mickey Mouse, when Mickey Mouse in person came by plane to Delhi and landed in Delhi, what did you? Th how did you think they received him? Hmm? They offered arati. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so <laughs> so India has moved along, as you can see. Didn't stay behind at all. Huh? It's the, you know, Indira Gandhi sort of for a long time kept things out, Rajiv tried to change it, and Sringa Rao finished it. <laughs> uh, after that, you know, we had, India had Fruti, Maruti, and it was also a Western nation. I mean, I went through all this because I was living in India at that time. I saw the changes. And uh, therefore, uh, and I remember when we used to go to the IIT, the Indian Institute for Technology in Delhi, was preaching to young students, they were feeling like, but why are you coming with this message? We cannot go back to where we came from. You know, I mean, we left our village, we're trying to be progressive, and we cannot go back to where we came from. All right, philosophically, we had an easy answer. And the easy answer was Yukta Vairagya. Aha, uh -huh, yes, you can take anything and engage it in the service of Krishna. And in that way, it becomes transcendental. Um, all right, uh, that may be true, but then I like the topic where Srila Prabhupada speaks about uh, factories being the dungeons of the demons. And yes, we have all the products from these dungeons and these products are products of Ukra Karma. Prabhupada translates Ukra Karma as horrible work meant to destroy the world. Literally, ugra means angry or aggressive, karma, work. Um, so, 
We can engage all kinds of products from modern society in the service of Krishna. Uh, and we can live a modern lifestyle um, downtown. In London, in the morning, people, they just go into the tube as if it's a vacuum cleaner. There's this big hole in the crowd. <laughs> people are running in as if they're sucked in. They stand to the right, run on the left, and they just run down and down and down, deep, deep into the tube. And stand clear of the door. <laughs> uh, and at night, they're spit out again. <laughs> And then somewhere in between, you check your rounds. You can hang in between somewhere, uh, you know. Uh, so like that, living in a modern lifestyle, uh, how does it fit? Yukta Vairakya, okay, but, you know, uh, we're still chanting Hare Krishna. And, and how do you do it? In the car? In the traffic jam? Or, you know, or when? In the lunch break? Or in front of the TV, or while downloading your mail, or, you know, one hand the phone and the other hand the beats. <laughs> on a clicker, or, or... It's like, very different. Uh, very different from village life. Uh, in village life, there are basically three times. Morning, noon, and evening. Uh, and it's not so exact. Morning, uh, morning, yeah, what time? Uh, morning, we see you. <laughs> yeah. in the, the village. Uh, what time will we meet? Morning. morning. Uh, what time in the morning? Yeah. Morning. Anything <laughs> we'll do, right? Noon, you know. Morning means anywhere from, uh, you know, 4 till 4 a.m. till uh, 2 a.m. 2 a.m. That's morning. Noon is anywhere from 11 till, uh, till 5. And that's all noon. And the evening, well, evening goes into the <laughs> deep hours of the night. So it's all stretchable, it is all not so precise. There is time, there is no rush, there is no pressure. Uh, one can sit under a banyan tree and just chant away. So uh, this culture, this Vaishnav culture, uh, first developed in that kind of an atmosphere where one could sit for hours peacefully and life was peacefully and slow. Uh, the traffic coming by, you know, some buffalo. So it's a whole different thing. Like the fast, uh, the fast lifestyle uh, on the edge that we live, downtown Sydney. Uh, you just nobody thinks about it. You cross the street, you stand on the middle white line, and traffic is going past, and you're just totally relaxed. You know? This guy's like almost driving your nose off with big buses, and you stand there as if it's the most normal thing in the world. Totally not faced out. Uh, uh, so what is, is our modern lifestyle doing to us sometimes? Um, sometimes you think we struggle because of the world we live in. And if we would live in, in another world, it would be so much easier. Um, so difficult. Krishna consciousness is difficult because you can't eat anything. Yeah? Everything is messed up, some way or other. But you have to read 20 times the label, the E numbers, the this, that. Uh, I mean, uh, it's difficult, very difficult. Whereas in Vedic culture, you could eat practically anything. You just off it. Off you go. <laughs> uh -huh. So there is a lot of undue stress on a devotee lifestyle. And uh, I think the environment is, um, is difficult. Srila Prabhupada tried to create alternative environments, uh, uh, communities of devotees who would live together and could practice the Krishna consciousness and that. And that was uh, 
in itself a good idea, but there was, for a while it functioned, but eventually the trust broke down. Because if you live all together, then it's only possible if there is trust and if people are trustworthy. Then trustworthy means that they are really going to look after each other. That didn't happen. And therefore, everyone started to think, well, we're going to rely on ourselves. So, the, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness went through an interesting development. Um, we see that in Prabhupada's time, and in the years after, the devotees were all staying together in communities. Um, here in Australia, you will also see uh, now we are in Govinda Valley, that's a new style project. In ancient times, people were staying on uh, farm projects. And they had quite a number and they all lived together. We still have some left over. Uh, and you go over down, but then you see, like, what's it called? The underground near, near Melbourne. Uh, nobody really living there anymore. Uh, it's like that. Because that, I, that faith broke, the faith that we will just live in our alternative devotee world where everyone will nicely take care of each other and everything will be based on Vaishnav principles and then uh, uh, it doesn't work out like that. The management is not always so sweet and before you know it, you say, I want my own house, I want my own fence, I want my own everything, yes, and then chant Hare Krishna. And before we know it, we're back in the world. So therefore, I'm bringing this up because I'm looking still at it from the personal perspective. So uh, one has to understand that faith um, is, is not something you have or don't have. Um, that is not our approach to faith. Uh, in some in some traditions in the world, they ask, you know, if you are a believer, you know, do you believe, brother? Do you believe? Do you believe? <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, like, I'm a believer. <laughs> <laughs> All the blessings on you. And um, if you're not a believer, too bad for you. <laughs> then sorry. Then for you, it's down, down, down all the way. Uh, but such things you cannot force, believe. Uh, in fact, it is said that doubt is a symptom of intelligence. Yeah. Uh, I mean, only a fool just believes anything and everything, right? As they say, you can... Uh, what, is, what was it again? You can fool some of the people, some, you can fool all of the people. Some of the time you can fool some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. <laughs> yeah? You got that one? Yes. So that's a fact. Uh, that uh, we see through things. Uh, we see that people are cheating. We catch them. And therefore there is doubt. And doubt is sort of necessary. First we must investigate. Prabhupada said to one, there was one boy in New York who was serving Prabhupada so nicely, so nicely. And he would open the door, he would always be attentive. Prabhupada need, needed water, boom, the cup was there. And one day Prabhupada said to him, he said, if you come on sentiment, you will leave on sentiment. And after some time that boy left. And Prabhupada saw through him, he saw he doesn't, he hasn't investigated. He has a nice attitude, but he hasn't really investigated what, what is actually, uh, what are they actually saying here? What are they actually believing here? And does it make sense? Right? One has to investigate in Krishna consciousness. If one simply walks into the door and is there and sort of like, well, you know, uh, uh, I never really thought about it. I, I just, uh, you know, I kind of like it. Uh, that's not enough. No. We must go deep in what is, what is, 
Prabhupada really saying? What is the Bhagavatam really saying? Uh, what does it all... What are the teachings? We have to thoroughly understand it. Uh, because only then, only then our faith can be complete. Therefore they say tattva. Tattva means the philosophical truth. Uh, one has to... It's a tattva is the basis for rasa, for experience. Without tattva, the rasa cannot be complete. Uh, it is understanding, a tattva, that makes things deep. Uh, so Prabhupada was giving a lot of philosophy. Uh, he was not telling so many nice stories about Krishna and so on. He gave a lot of philosophy as to give us reasons why to be Krishna conscious. Definitely. Still, he also gave us many, many nice things. Uh, he gave us um, many descriptions about Krishna. He translated 10th Canto of Bhagavatam, Krishna book. Or he gave us also descriptions of Krishna in the Nectar of Devotion, um, where we could uh, actually see the qualities of Krishna and become attracted to Krishna. So both go hand in hand. Um, one has to understand thoroughly what is the difference between Krishna and Narayan? Um, what is the difference between Krishna and Balaram? What is the difference between Krishna and Balaram? What is the difference? Huh? I'm trying to hear. Somebody is mumbling, but... One's black, one's white. One is master, one is servant. Yeah. The expansion of Krishna is Balram. Yeah, correct. Yeah, because Prabhupada often says there's no difference between Krishna and Balram. The same, the same Supreme Personality of Godhead, but in a different mood. But the same. Otherwise, the same. The very same. Uh, who knows all these things? Right? Who understands all these things? So one must understand how, how the Lord expands himself. Um, or, so that, and what is the Lord doing in all these expansions? Krishna, uh, Krishna is, is absorbed in his own pleasure pastimes. Krishna is not going to bother with the material world. Uh, that concept of you know, we spoke this morning about 144,000 people going to heaven and the rest is on the kingdom of God on earth and the guys in heaven have to work. Then better stay on earth, isn't it? <laughs> if, yeah, if you have a job in heaven, uh, better be here. So, Krishna in the spiritual world is not concerned with the material world. He has nothing to do with the material world and his eternally liberated associates also. They're nothing to do. Krishna's expansions deal with the material world. Uh, and the demigods deal with the material world. But the liberated souls, they don't deal with the material world. They are in the spiritual world. So we have to first thoroughly understand uh, the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Who is Krishna? Uh, it says in the Bhagavad Gita, there are five topics. Um, these topics are Isvara, that is Krishna. The topics are Jiva, the living being, and then Karma, uh, then Prakriti, the material energy, and finally time, color. And these are the five topics. So it's basically uh, the living being is, is entangled in Karma. And therefore gets bound by time uh, due to the fact that the living being is trying to exploit Prakriti and therefore the relationship with the Supreme Lord is not able to manifest in its full glory and so on. So in this way we can understand uh, some philosophical points. Uh, that is there. Well I told you that uh, if I would have made my mind map, that it would have been definitely different from yours. I would have put uh, Prabhupada as my principal root. 
the, the, the main reason why I'm here is, is because I understood that Prabhupada was different. I understood that he was representing Vedic culture. Uh -huh. And I had, uh, I had before I came across Prabhupada, I had done some reading in some literatures and I had met many Babas in India, this Baba and that Baba. And uh, most of the Babas, to tell you the truth, were always smoking ganja. <laughs> and that was mostly what was going on. And uh, plus, then if they would see me as a foreigner, they would say, uh, what is your name? What is your country? Yes, can you give some bhakjis? Eh? Every time. So it wasn't very, they weren't very spiritual. They weren't very convincing. Um, then, you, then there were those who were more sophisticated in various ashrams. Um, but they invariably had an impersonist view. Always the same thing. It's all Brahman. Eh? And uh, I had my doubts that it stopped there. I was not satisfied with this Brahman concept. So anyway, I came uh, to Prabhupada and I could see that uh, here is a person uh, who is very learned and also uh, very realized. Uh, I'd seen, yeah, in India you can always read uh, on any railway platform a book about a certain Swami, uh, his book is called Biography of a Yogi. Right? And many have read it, right? because in any railway uh, station in the bookstore, it's there, right? Because it's always in your face, Biography of a Yogi. And uh, so I read that uh, biography, and uh, I must say that I didn't like it. And I tell you, and this, I read it before I met Prabhupada, and I tell you why I didn't like it. Um, first of all, it describes all kinds of yogis and, and what great powers they had. There was one yogi, he was so powerful, he was able to fight with tigers, with bare hand. And one day, that yogi just knocked a brick out of the wall. Say, okay, some sort of karate. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't overly impressed. And then, you know, uh, so in this way, one day, one day, the writer of the book came, his guru was visiting, and the guru was in the room next door. And when he came in the room next door, his guru was sitting on the ceiling. I was like, wow. And then Guruji said, so, what would you like? Um, he said, pomegranates from Kabul. Guruji said, go look in the room next door. And yes, there was a big branch full of big juicy pomegranates. Wow. Um, again, I was not so impressed uh, because I had studied something about mystic power. Uh, before Krishna consciousness, I had investigated many different thoughts and I'd read an interesting book or series of books actually. There was a certain person named uh, who had Carlos Castaneda and he had met in Mexico uh, a person who was from an Indian, red Indian background and who had uh, mystic powers and so on. And he was teaching him. Uh, he was teaching him. So he taught him different tricks. And he taught him how to run in a forest in the dark without hitting a tree. Well, that's impressive. Yeah. He taught him to look in a particular way and you could cross, you could see energy lines in water. And then if you st stepped on the cross points, you could walk on water. And he walked on water and all that. Well, you know, okay, he walked on water. He 
was able to run in the forest in the night. So it was interesting. I, I bought book number two. It went on all the way up to book number four. In book number four, the, the man with the mystic power, he had all the mystic power now. And then, the time, in book number four, he was facing death. And death came before him. And with his mystic power, he was engaging in a mystic dance with death and warding off death until, at the end, he lost and died. <laughs> I took the books and threw them in the bin, you know. I said, this is garbage, right? He all that trouble and what happened, he lost anyway. Right? So I could see that Mystic power does not go beyond death. Uh, mystic power may give us now some temporary power. Okay, there are many ways to get power. Right? I mean, missiles also give you power. Right? Uh, you know, an M16 is also quite effective. <laughs> uh, there are many ways to get power in the world. Uh, uh, so, Modern, Prabhupada also mentioned, modern man has achieved many of the things that previously the yogis were doing with mystic powers. They're flying in the sky they, and things like that. Yeah. So, I could see it is temporary. The result is temporary. That's not interesting. When, by the time I came to Prabhupada, uh, I found many things that I recognized, that I had already been thinking. Yeah. I found, I had already been thinking, yes, I was a vegetarian uh, for a long time, and I was, uh, that was obvious. And uh, this mystic power, I was not impressed by it. Uh, um, I had taken many things from different sources. The other day, I was in a university and someone asked a question and said, is it in Krishna consciousness that we at one point find that many of the things we believed before, that we just have to realize it's all rubbish and that we have to reject it all? I said, no, it's not like that. It is that we should realize that many of the things we were into before were incomplete. Um, I used to, well, as a kid, I had comic books. Uh, and most kids have comic books. And in my days, the Tin Tin was the big series. You know? And you may not have read Tin Tin. If you haven't, if you have, well, then, yeah, then you're lucky, you know. <laughs> if you haven't, what can I say? Uh, one, one is particularly good, Tin Tin in Tibet, right? because besides Tibet, uh, he's also in India, and there is a holy cow, and the sacred cow is on the road, and uh, a lot of uh, spiritual elements were, were in that comic book. It was my favorite one. I always liked it. Right? So, um, I was attracted to these these things, and um, so it also raised some interest in Tibet. So I decided to, um, when I grew up, I read the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Many of you may have read it, many of you may have not read it, whatever, I read it. Um, and uh, within that book, there is a description about life after death. Yeah. And it describes what happens with the soul and it goes out of the body and how there are different confrontations with divine manifestations. And the soul who recognizes becomes liberated. So, okay. Um, it's established for it established something that I also thought already, myself. I thought, yes, there is eternal life. There is life after death. I felt it in myself. And just reading that book reconfirmed it. It reconfirmed it. Oh. Uh, 
coming to India and there were, and seeing uh, a dead man lying on the on the street one day in Benares, a beggar, and people walking past and throwing coins on the body. That was something I didn't understand. I said, why are they all throwing coins on the body? I looked, I saw, here's a beggar. They were burying him in money. I was like, this is ironic. The man died of poverty, and now they're burying him in coins. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of culture is this? <laughs> strange land. I was 17. It was strange. So I asked someone, and they explained, no, when someone dies, the the soul goes out of the body, looks down upon the body, cannot go back inside, but wants to go back inside. Therefore, in our culture, the, the body must be burned so that that soul is forced to go on on his destiny. Since he had no money, everyone chips in so that, we can buy, so that they can buy some firewood and burn the body. Okay. <laughs> now, what a culture, right? In the West, they would spend millions to save a life, right? And in India, they let him die. <laughs> and then they spend some money, you know, to buy the firewood, to save his soul, right? I mean, it was interesting, at least. You know, it was kind of, kind of an experience. Huh? But, again, it reconfirmed very much the um, existence of the soul separate from the body. So everyone in his life may have, through different channels, uh, through different means, received already some knowledge. Uh, some, okay, just from the parents, just by birth, right, in a country where such belief is coming. Uh, of course, one might say there are advantages to that, but also disadvantages to that. Um, one advantage is that uh, naturally one accepts it because as a child one accepts anything, whatever the parents say, as the truth. And so it, by the time one is an adult, it's deeply rooted. Um, for those who grew up in other cultures, when this um, understanding is gradually dawning. Uh, one sort of intuitively feels it's there, one reads here, one reads there, one has experiences, and gradually that faith that there is something is becoming firm. In that case, the, the, faith, the faith is not resting on, on much tradition, but it is a faith that has developed in in the individual himself, it's his own evolution. And therefore, oftentimes, his conviction is stronger. Right? But, uh, but we see that, on the other hand, those who have grown up in the culture, uh, even if their faith is sometimes not so strong, they still act according to the culture. Uh, and on the one hand, they may say, oh, this is my mythology, but yet they act in the culture. Uh, so there's these both sides to it. Um, now that we've come to Krishna consciousness, everyone has to uh, make up for what is lacking. If we're lacking tradition and culture, then now we need to find uh, gradually more tradition and culture. Uh, but Those who've grown up in tradition, they have to go much deeper and rediscover it for themselves. And cannot just on automatic pilot carry on, and this is what we learned. And you know, my great grandfather and great grandfather's great grandfather uh, have all been doing this. No. Plus, uh, Prabhupada also tells about uh, the uh, the person who had already learned music and then went, uh, well, met someone who was studying music. And the person he met had told him, yes, uh, it is a very good school and it is uh, not very expensive, and he gave the price. Then when our person who was a musician went to that school and 
asked if he could be admitted. They said yes, yes, yes. And then when he asked the price, they quoted him double from the other one. I said, hey, you know, I mean, my friend is paying half and you're charging me double. I said, yes, because you, your friend, he doesn't know any music. And you, and you, you already know. And therefore we're charging you double. He said, why are you charging me double? You should charge him double. Yeah? I mean, I already know. See, yeah, that's the difficulty. Because you've learned so many wrong habits. And now, you know, it will be hard to make you give them up and for you to learn it properly. Whereas the other guy, that's much easier. Uh, he doesn't know. So, it is like that. Uh, that we must understand that um, what we are, are learning from Srila Prabhupada is something we don't know. Ah, yes, Swamiji, it is so nice to meet you. You are, yes, uh, I'm so happy. Yes, we've been doing all these things, yes, for so many generations in my family. <laughs> no, you haven't. No, you haven't. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. With all due respect to all the generations, uh, you have not understood who Srila Prabhupada is. You have not understood what he is representing. You have not understood that what, you, what he is teaching is more. Uh, everyone has to pull his socks up, so to speak. Uh, everyone is put on his toes. Everyone, all of India, uh, would have to, if they would adhere to what Prabhupada was teaching, would have to come up in their standards a lot. Not a little, a lot, a lot. Um, that, is the, that is the situation. Um, because what Prabhupada in this Parampara is teaching is something, uh, as I said, it is secret. It is even not known in Vaishnav families. Because even these Vaishnav families are not coming in a Sampradaya. Are, are not coming, the Vaishnav families from Gujarat or Rajasthan or anywhere in India, uh, north, south, east, west, even they are not, uh, are by far not complete. Uh, and, and we have to come to that point to, to understand that if we really want to be devotees. Uh, same thing in the, in the West. We, we are dealing here with something that is beyond anything we've ever done. And therefore we must be in that mood from, all right, um, I will rearrange my life now according to Prabhupada's directions. Uh, that is uh, the unique uh, position that we have in dealing with Srila Prabhupada. We're dealing here with someone uh, who was actually uh, the chosen person to bring this, this, the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from east to west. Uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears once in a day of Brahma. That means that it is brought only once in a day of Brahma. You realize that there are in a day of Brahma a thousand cycles of four yugas. A thousand Kali Yugas, and only in one of them, only once, is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appearing, and only once are his teachings brought from east to west. Can you understand that the person who has been chosen for that is not just a, uh, a nice devotee, or just another sadhu from India, but that he is a particularly chosen instrument of the Lord. Therefore, we, this is called Shakti Avesh. He is an empowered instrument of the Lord. It is going beyond pure devotee. It is one who is chosen to take a special mission of the Lord from. Um, and therefore, we understand that Prabhupada was the most transparent person. Um, and, and simply, uh, wherever he went, he transformed that place. Wherever Prabhupada went, it became a holy place. It became, and we see that also. Uh, it's very interesting how, uh, how uh, in um, in 
you know, when Prabhupada was in America, he said that um, whoever gives a thousand dollar donation for my book production, my book fund, and who is giving a ticket for me and my secretary, that's where I will go. Ridayananda Maharaj said, okay, I'll do it. And he took Prabhupada to Gainesville. Now Gainesville is a place in the middle of nowhere. It's in the whoop whoops, it's in the sticks, it's, it's way out there, I'll tell you that, folks. And, you know, it's, it's just nowhere, uh, in, somewhere in Florida. And, and now it's bigger than it was then. So Prabhupada agreed, went to Gainesville, and somehow or other now, right, uh, in Gainesville, just outside, is the biggest uh, community of ISKCON devotees in the world. Uh, Alachua, where so many families are living together. Uh, and it's exactly in that place where Brahman went. What do you think? Coincidence. Mm -hmm. no. and, and if you ask people, why did you go? They said, oh, the land prices were, were cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, I, I don't think that's why you went there. I think simply because Prabhupada blessed the place. So we can, I can give, I could give a very long talk about the glories of Srila Prabhupada and I don't want to do that now because uh, we have about 25 minutes and I've spoken the whole morning and I've spoken now again. And, uh, but I wanted to make this point about Srila Prabhupada uh, very, very clear. Uh, he is dear to Krishna. And by and to go to Krishna, one must go to one, through one who is dear to Krishna. Uh, that is the system. Uh, one cannot go to Krishna directly. One must go to one who is dear to, through one who is dear to Krishna. And in that way, uh, we can learn. Uh, we, can, we must be very careful to uh, understand who Srila Prabhupada is. Yeah. That's very important. Uh, first of all, who he is as a person, what he did as a person, and then we should read his books. One time Prabhupada said, he said that uh, my purports are more important than the verses in the books. Well, uh, isn't that strange? I mean, aren't the, the verses supposed to be more important than the purports? And Prabhupada, no, the purports are more important than the verses, because without the purports, you cannot understand the verses. That makes sense, if you think of it like that. Um, so, therefore, uh, it is Prabhupada gives us the teachings, and Prabhupada gives us the blessings. Um, and by these two, you know, we do a whole life of devotional service. We chant a whole life of, uh, of miserable rounds every day again, you know. Oh my God. Krishna, Krishna, am I ever going to finish it? Eight done, halfway. Hare Krishna, nine done, okay, oh, it's over half. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, ten, boy, almost. The end is in sight. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Twelve, four more to go, Satan for tonight. Hare Krishna, oh dear, oh God, I've got four left. Oh no, anyway, Hare Krishna. Very quickly, uh, and in that way, uh, we are full of love and devotion. Telling <laughs> <laughs> the holy name and offering it to Krishna from the heart, you know. Uh, the happiest moment in, in our chanting is when the 16 rounds are finished. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to, to be so blunt. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, you th do, do, do we honestly think that this chanting that we're doing is going to attract the Supreme Lord. Krishna is listening to these broken names. Oh my God. Oh, he sits there like, oh. Uh, I mean, but then, uh, then there is, is Prabhupada. 
the pure devotee whose, whose prayer is there. Uh, please, they're trying. Please accept. Please take them back. Then what's Krishna going to do? Yeah? What's he going to do? What can you say? Uh, you know, you know, when your wife says something, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> and when Prabhupada says, what's Krishna going to do? He's like, they're close. Therefore, these blessings of one who is very close to Krishna are much more powerful than all the service that we can do in a lifetime. Because our service is so small and his service so significant that we should understand. I just wanted to emphasize that so that we kind of see how important Srila Prabhupada is for us. We need his teachings and we need his blessings. These two are, are essential to us. Okay, I have, I'd like to now uh, invite you to, uh, to ask questions if, if you like. Whatever questions you have so far, uh, we have stirred up. I've tried to stir up different things in the morning. In the afternoon, I took it a little, uh, took it a little bit about east-west and cultural transplant, and then Prabhupada. So if you have any questions, then, then please now ask a question. And then we spent the last 20 minutes for Q and A, and then we'll have a little bhajan. That's the plan. Yes. Maharaj, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says a simple, uh, in a simple way that if you always think about Him, then you will reach Him. But when we start to do the devotional service, when we are in one level and then the complexity increases <laughs> and then you got to do this thing and this thing, and then the whole becomes, the whole everything becomes a, you know, like, it's like can we do it? So how do we tackle that? Yeah, in the beginning we say, just chant and be happy. <laughs> uh, and then things like that. Uh, with time, the, uh, the complexity, the, the responsibility in our practices uh, increases. Um, yes, uh, how can we be successful? Um, well, with time we also realize that we're, that we're falling short. Um, we become more and more aware. Like, at first initiation it's about um, following four regulative principles. At second initiation it's about developing Brahminical qualities. So the first one is about what you do, and the second one is what you're supposed to be. Doing things is one thing. Being. Uh, being saint, doing something saintly, okay, even when you're the devil himself with a tail, you know, you can sometimes fold your hands and, you know, and say, Go But to be saintly is another thing. Uh, so with time, uh, it is more difficult. And we realize more and more that we're falling short. Um, I saw an old Vaishnava, um, one of Srila Prabhupada's godbrothers, who visited our temple on Prabhupada's uh, disappearance celebration, which we celebrate once a year. And he came to the Krishna Bhagavan temple and uh, he was 93. So his memory was not working anymore and uh, complicated lectures, it was also beyond him. So he was giving a simple, had a simple approach. He said, Swamiji, referring to Prabhupada, he said, Swamiji made you all Vaishnavas, so you can give blessings. Therefore, you please bless me. So it was, uh, it was short, but it was interesting. Uh, because, first of all, he appreciated that Prabhupada made all these people into Vaishnavas. It's not a small thing, so he recognized what Prabhupada did. Second of all, since they were Vaishnavas, he, he acknowledged the fact that a Vaishnava can give blessings. 
So then, you please give them to me. So why? Why was he saying like that? Because at age 93, he realized, I've done a lifetime of service, and I'm not sure if it's going to be enough. Um, therefore, I need all the blessings I can get. Right? Now, I'm not 93, I'm approaching 60, but I'm also beginning to think like that. Uh, I'm also thinking like I don't have, uh, uh, I didn't do very much in this life. Def and I'm looking at all of you and I'm thinking you all are Vaishnavas. Therefore I'm also thinking you please bless me. Agreed. He doesn't want to give. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm not a Vaishnava. Huh? Oh dear, dear. No. Is there a note? Question? Oh, okay, okay. I thought it was one of those notes, Maharaj, get off this. I had those notes before. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, you are a Vaishnava. One cannot say I'm not a Vaishnava because that one thinks that one's sin is more powerful than the process. And then one makes his own fallen condition more powerful so, than, than, than the mercy of Krishna. Like, so that, no, we, we don't want to become Vaishnavas, actually. But we are here, even although we're not willing, somehow still Vaishnava. Still so please bless <laughs> Agreed. He agrees. All of you also. Please agree. You have to, you have to say yes. Or bless. Not laugh. <laughs> You're supposed to bless. It's very tough. No one wants to bless this one. They only want the blessings from us. That's but, right, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. And where do we get them? That's not proper. That's. Uh, but we need them from you also. Uh, it is like that. Uh, so with time, as we're falling short, we, we realize more and more how much we rely on blessings. And therefore, with time, we realize that uh, I must become more careful in my dealing to the Vaishnavas. Uh, before, I was a bit careless, you know, this guy, that guy, and then, no, but with time, uh, I must be careful in all my dealings with the Vaishnava. Let me not offend the Vaishnava. Let every Vaishnava think well about me. Uh, that is a blessing. When a Vaishnava thinks favorable about you, that's a blessing. So with time, uh, one gets in this room. That's all that can save us. Because everyone will feel that he's falling short. And it is like that. <coughs> you were talking about Srila Prabhupada and his exalted position. How does one increase his faith that Srila Prabhupada is, a, is in a unique position without minimizing the importance of other teachers? Um, well, there are many teachers before Srila Prabhupada, in, a, in our Sampradaya, who also play a very major role. Uh, we see that uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is there, then, then the six Goswamis, they are amazing personalities, brilliant personalities, learned, they write all the books, uh, uh, then Krishna Kaviras Goswami, amazing uh, personality, after him, Maratandas Thakur carried the weight. Um, he was the one, the embodiment of the brain of, of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It is uh, every day we are chanting songs of Maratandas Thakur. Uh, Maratandas Thakur had an enormous influence on our spiritual life. We are still looking at him. Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur is taking inspiration from Narottam Thakur. 
And Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, uh, he gave us so many insights in, in the Vrindavan pastimes of Krishna. And we sing every day the Guru Vastakam at Mongolati. Guru Puja is Naratanda Thakur's song. Uh, so like that, uh, these acharyas are very much part of our uh, lives. So we respect them all. Then Bhaktivinoda Thakur begins to create, Krishna, adjust Krishna consciousness to the modern world. Then Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, such a brilliant personality, just like, uh, what a preacher. You know, he had a festival in Calcutta, on the Maidan in Calcutta, which lasted one month. And he had, that festival was, uh, was huge. There was a map of India on one acre, which was all made out of, uh, of cement, and you could walk through this. And on this map were all the places where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went when he went through South India, also the places where Nichananda went when he went to all the holy places, and all the temples of the Gaudiya Mount. So you could walk through this one acre and you could just make a whole journey through India. Then next to it there were many, there were acres with exhibitions and all these things. And this was only this, the spiritual part. Then he had around it, on the outside, he had uh, cultural things from different states of India. Every state had some representation and would show some local traits from their state, some cloth, some this, some that. Right? So in that way, uh, it was a theistic exhibition, that's what they called it. And it lasted for one month. Millions, crores of people would go to there uh, in this exhibition. I mean, that is enormous, enormous what he did. If we would do anything like, like that in Sydney, imagine, you know, an enormous show which was going for one month, attracting millions and millions of people. I mean, that's what he did, just to name something, you know, so many things. So, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta was also a spiritual giant, you know? and then Prabhupada. But, Prabhupada is the one who kind of, okay, this is, I think it's enough, it's, uh, I'll keep on <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, I'll definitely keep them on. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's really nice of you. We'll, uh, we'll definitely keep them in a box and every once in a while pull one out uh, for the rest of the seminar. Uh, anyway, so uh, we can appreciate all the previous acharyas, but Prabhupada uh, particularly put Krishna consciousness in the form for the modern man. And that's us. We're all modern men. We live in modern times. Prabhupada said, this yes, this no. He established the standards for us today. Therefore, we must go to him. And now, his followers. Amongst his followers, there are also many exalted personalities. But they do not change the standards. They uphold the standards that Prabhupada gave. Prabhupada established the standards from modernity, we are simply bringing those standards. Yeah. Therefore, uh, if he is proud of, at whose feet all masters sit. So in this way we can fully appreciate the problem without minimizing anyone. It seems that the Western world has become in the last 40 years so much more degraded. What can the devotees do to protect themselves uh, is the golden age predicted within Kali Yuga happening now? Yes, it is, because uh, this chanting of Hare Krishna is just spreading like anything. It's just amazing that more and more people are getting caught up in it. And why? Uh, why any of you? Uh, you can see, you come to Australia to make a fortune, and what do you get? Krishna consciousness. Yeah? Everyone left India, uh, you know, 
to come to Australia to make to make yeah, material progress, and what happens? You make spiritual progress. Right? People in South America, right? somehow or other, Krishna consciousness is there. Krishna consciousness is everywhere. And so uh, it is for each of us, uh, not by our plan that we became Krishna conscious. It's all by a higher arrangement, and we can see that. It's by some higher arrangement that we're part of this movement. We thought uh, that we were going to do one thing, and then another thing was happening. It means that the golden age is happening through us. Um, it is happening through us. We are looking at the golden age outside ourselves, and we say, is it happening? No, we should look at ourselves. Then we can answer the question, is it happening? It is definitely happening. Otherwise, why would we be here? Because just by our own destiny, we should not be here. <laughs> hmm? You see? So the, and the golden age will catch on and everything else will fall, uh, will, will disappear. Can we improve our chanting with yoga? If yes, tell us some methods, please. Huh? You see, chanting is not about a technique. It's, uh, there are, of course, you can do some technique, you can do some pranayama, and become peaceful, and then try to chant. And it will help a little bit. Um, it can help a little bit, but not really that much. We have, to, we have to see it like this. The holy name is Krishna. And the more we become attracted and attached to Krishna, the more we chant with taste. And the more we chant with taste, the more we naturally have a desire to chant. And when we have a desire to chant, then we can, can chant a lot and attentive. So therefore, we have to develop our attachment to Krishna um, more and more. That is really... Uh, the answer. And how to do it? By hearing about Krishna and by serving Krishna. In these ways. And by serving the devotees of Krishna. In that way, our attachment to Krishna will grow deeper and then our chanting will improve. Uh, and there's no need for techniques. What is the significance of 16 rounds? Is it the standard uh, round for the day? Actually, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says in Chaitanya Bhagavad that he will not accept the offering of anyone who doesn't chant, who is not a Lakpati. And he meant to say, who is not chanting 64 rounds. So he, but then, uh, Prabhupada, he did so much service. He made such a sacrifice. And on the strength of that service and sacrifice, Prabhupada prayed to Lord Chaitanya. Please accept this number of 16 rounds. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's minimal, but somehow or other accept their offerings, accept them at 16 rounds. So that's what it is. It is the reduced number combined with Prabhupada's prayer. And therefore, uh, no one has the power. Who? A sadhu. A sadhu can deliver others on the strength of his own service, you see. Uh, so Prabhupada on the strength of his service could make this adjustments. Rishi uh, Uchu, the saintly person has spoken, then Krishna will uphold. Uh, uh, example is given about Lord Brahma gave the blessings to Hirani Kasipu, not in the day, not in the night, not inside, not outside, not on the ground, not in the air, etc. And the Lord upheld it and became the Sri So, the Lord kept the word of Brahma. So in the same way, we see Uchu, the saintly personality speaks. And Prabhupada said, and if the saintly personality says, four regulated principles in 16 rounds and you will go back to God, then you must go. So that's why 16, it is a special discount that Prabhupada as a broker has, has arranged for us. Otherwise, it would be 64. <laughs>
Sometimes devotees have many disappointing relationships. How can they develop their faith in their, in their relationship with Krishna? Please explain. Uh, Krishna is not of this world. Krishna is of the spiritual world. Krishna is always grateful. Krishna uh, never disappoints uh, any of his devotees. So, when Draupadi had done service by holding on to her sari and when Dusasana tried to pull it off and then she let go and called out, Hey Govinda, Krishna saw that surrender. And Krishna said, Draupadi has, has purchased me. Uh, whenever I remember her service, I feel my appreciation for her increasing. So that is Krishna. He is not betraying anyone. So the more we hear about Krishna's qualities, um, the more we can appreciate Krishna's nature and character, then we can have faith. Because Krishna is not a person, a conditioned soul is not from this world. We talked about the roots of faith, having just Srila Prabhupada's blessings. Is it a strong enough root for faith? Didn't you say having one root will not make the tree strong? Uh-huh, yes. I didn't say uh, that I had only one root. I said the principal root is Prabhupada, is the Prabhupada's root. It begins there, but then we must have roots in, in the Vedic scripture, having faith in the Vedic scripture. We must have roots in, uh, in, uh, in, with the other Acharyas. We must have roots in worshipping the deity. Uh, like for example, why do I have faith in worshipping the deity? Because I see that when people worship the deity, that they become saintly. So it cannot be a statue. If you worship a statue, you don't become saintly. Uh, you try a statue of Karl Marx or something, or, uh, or just around, uh, just near the, the North Sydney Temple, on the other side of the park, there is this statue of a soldier and it says that the greatest thing you can do is to give your life for your country. And I'm shaking my hand thinking, oh boy, oh boy, you blew it. <laughs> You should have come to the other side of the park. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, so we need many roots. Huh? That was the morning. Many roots. In the afternoon I spoke about Prabhupada because it's such an important root. But we need very broad root. We need learning in the scripture. We need to know the books. Because if you Chanakya Pandit says, let not a day go by without learning a verse, or at least half a verse, or a line of a verse, or one word of a verse. Such verses give us shelter. They give us shelter. We find shelter in them. Yeah. We should be learned. But of course, we are a little lazy, uh, all of us in this age. Always find an excuse not to, to learn a verse. But we should learn verses of scripture. We should really do all those things. So we need many roots. Uh -huh. Please tell us how can we improve our chanting? By chanting. <laughs> <laughs> and by hearing. And by but hearing our chanting and by trying to avoid offenses against the chanting. Then, uh, somehow or other, our chanting will improve. How do we learn to prioritize when we have so many obligations in life? Uh, most of the obligations we should, uh, first of all, uh, one should not get himself so entangled in so many obligations. Uh, so if you have so many obligations in life, then you have created all these obligations, first of all. Uh, we are, uh, uh, you say, like, how do I get out of a hole? How do I get out of this hole? 
who dug it in the first place? <laughs> he said, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, you dug a huge hole, and so deep, and now you're in there, and now you're asking me, how do I get out of here? But you're the one who dug it in the first place. All right, now we have to dig ourselves out of the hole. If you, here you can dig a hole, deep hole, and then you find yourself in there without a ladder, what do you do? You have to little by little then make a path out of the hole. You have to dig out a staircase. Yeah, yeah. then you get out. Yeah. So the point is that uh, it's going to take some time to disentangle ourselves. We entangle ourselves. Now uh, suddenly uh, we are saying, oh, how can I, can I practice when I'm so entangled? Yes. We have to first disentangle ourselves. So, what do we really need? And what is not so important? Let's minimize our needs and life becomes more simple. The more needs we have, the more complicated life is. You were mentioning in the morning that we can love but can't trust others. My question is that, isn't it, if you love someone, you trust also? Well, you know, I think, yes, gradually the trust will also develop and should develop. When I mentioned that this morning, uh, love yes, trust no, uh, I wasn't speaking about deep, deep, intimate relationships. Uh, I was just trying to emphasize the difficulty we have to come to trust in relationships. Um, there is a philosopher named Pascal, and Pascal said, if Friends would know what friends say behind their back, there wouldn't be any friends in the world. <laughs> well, maybe if we could change that, if we could prove that wrong, yeah, that would be nice. That would be really nice. So, uh, as I said, before trust, let's be trustworthy. Let's be trustworthy. And then trust will increase. Don't worry so much about who you can trust. Worry about being trustworthy. And then, actually, trust can develop. How do we measure our faith? Okay, it is said there are three, uh, three types of faith. The Kanissa, the Madhyam, and the Uttan Adhikari. Kanissa has weak faith. He is full of material desires. Um, did I ever do that little uh, uh, drama for you of the man who was working on the roof? No, I'm going to do it now. I'm slightly over time, but it's us. I need to stretch anyway. Oh, yes. Oh, dear. Oh, this roof. This roof has been too much. It's leaking, you know, all the kitchen pots are just like full of water. And it's enough is enough, you know. I mean, we've got to fix it, right? So, it's a, it's a great sunny day today, and I'm up here, yes, way up here, yes, but, you know, I have no fear of heights at all, oh no, and I will fix this. And suddenly, <gasps> slip, and then, last minute, saved. <sighs> anyway, then I tried to pull myself up on the roof, but due to the regular prasadam intake <laughs> and, and the lack of exercise, <laughs> I couldn't get myself back on the roof. So at that point, I was hanging on the roof. I said, I said oh God, oh God, please save me. A voice from behind, need any help? Who are you? I am God. Oh God, oh God, please, please, help me, help me. All right, just let go of the roof and I will catch you. Uh, can't you catch me first? And then I'll let go of the roof. So you see the point, huh? The neophyte wants to be caught first. He will only give up all his material securities if 
if he gets the spiritual experience first, but no. The intermediate devotee is ready to give up material security just for Krishna, with faith, and then see what comes. You know, the most devotee is always living in his relationship with Krishna. Like that, there are three levels of devotees. And is there absolute faith? Yes, that is the topmost devotee who knows that Krishna is that absolute truth. Uh, okay, this is the last one, and then we'll do a little kirtan. Whatever happens to us is based on our karma. Our every action, every moment is based on Krishna's mercy. Both the points above look contradictory to me. Krishna makes our karma, and again, based on Krishna's mercy, we experience our karma. Why is he playing this game with us? We're not playing our game. Now, uh, we make our karma. Huh? Yes. And that is going on. And Krishna... But as soon as we engage in devotional service, then our karma becomes dissolved. We become freed from karma. Devotional service removes karma. And therefore it all goes off the bill. Basically it's like this. You know, that, uh, have you ever been in a restaurant where they give you stingy portions? You know what I mean? You, come, you order a thing and then it comes on the table and it's not what you thought it was going to be. And you're hungry, you know? So he said, is that it? You know? If this is the Allah, you know? Allah flam? No, I don't believe it. Anyway, and then they bring, you order something more. And it's still not enough. And you order, some, okay, bring some roti, bring some this, and everything is charged separately. At the end, you get a bill, the shock of your life. And you say, we didn't have all this. No way, no way, no, 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 no. And then the waiter says, yes, you did, it was on this plate. Mm. But that we didn't have, yes, it came in this bowl. Mm. But that, no. So with karma, it's the same. We are always thinking, I didn't do that, I didn't do this. But it's all on the bill, on the karma bill. Everything is there. But then when we begin to engage in devotional service, Krishna takes a pen, he just takes so many things off the bill. And at one point, when we are just surrendered enough, Krishna takes the whole bill, breaks it up, rips it up and chucks it out. Then, all come and gone. So do not worry, there is no game. We are the ones who are playing the game, it's not Krishna who is playing the game. We are playing the game. Um, um, we are, there is this rotating thing and we push it hard and then it comes back. Oh, oh. Why is it hitting me? <laughs> You're pushing it. <laughs> Stop pushing. It won't hit you anymore. And as simple as that. So that is karma. We are pushing and then it rotates and hits us. Yes. So, if we stop pushing, then it will be over. Krishna is not playing with us. We ourselves are playing with Krishna's mercy. Alright, I, I left a few questions for Ron, for later on. Uh, now we'll uh, just have a little kirtan.